Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club and the Westpac Address, coming to you today from Ngunnawal and Nambri country, Canberra. My name is Laura Tingle. I'm the club's president. I don't think I know that the France-Australia diplomatic relationship has been through some tumultuous times in recent years. But our joint interests in Pacific geopolitics, climate change and defence collaboration continue and the relationship has been steadily been, steadily been rebuilding. France, along with a number of other European nations, is taking a greater interest in our region. And a European presence has a crucial role to play, not just in our region, but in some of the major conflicts troubling the world just now, notably both Ukraine and in the Middle East. This makes our speaker today particularly compelling. And the breadth of the Foreign Minister's CV is also particularly compelling. Everything from spokesperson for the Presidency of the French Republic to Vice President of the Cannes Film Festival, from French representative to UNESCO to French ambassador to the United Kingdom in the aftermath of Brexit. Please welcome her to the podium to address us today. Thank you, Laura. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Dear friends, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank the National Press Club for welcoming me today. It is my first official visit to Australia, but actually also my first visit ever to Australia. And I'm delighted to be here in Canberra before heading to Melbourne tomorrow. Thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for this opportunity you give me to present some of our views on the Pacific region. And I'm very much aware that I stand before you uh, eight months after my colleague and friend, Senator Penny Wong, delivered a seminal address on Australia's foreign policy. So it is a challenge I will not even try to meet. But I read Senator's words uh, again uh, on my way from uh, COP28 in Dubai to Australia yesterday, and it was inspiring. So my first message to you after reading this speech is simple. Our visions are much closer than one may think. We share the same values. We share the same attachment to multilateralism, to the international rules-based order, and the same will to protect and promote it. We know where we stand, we know who our friends are, and we know where the threats come from. In our fragmented world, a uh, difficult one, as we see, with more and more crisis, more and more challenges, less and less respect for the uh, core principles of the UN Charter, we should all do our best to avoid blocks dynamics because we've seen these dynamics uh, in the past and we know where they led. So our approach, therefore, should not be a binary one of us or them, but one approach based on inclusiveness and solidarity, deeply rooted in increased cooperation between fully sovereign states. Nothing you hear, you might say, and I say it the first hand. It has been France's DNA since uh, General de Gaulle, maybe even before that, France has always followed its own path, seeking convergences and providing options to all partners so that they can freely choose their way, so they can have the freedom of their sovereignty, to quote my president in one of his favorite sentences, the freedom of the sovereignty, this freedom that we cherish for ourselves as well as for others, along with liberty and equality, of course. That's what we've been doing in developing what we call these partnerships of sovereignty, in particular in the Indo-Pacific. First with India, then Japan, and now with Indonesia, to mention just a few among uh, many. Our foreign policy is focused on building bridges between partners. We do not subscribe to the artificial vision, division line between, as some say today, the West and the rest, 
or between demonized northern countries and the so-called global south, an expression often used by countries which, by the way, are neither developing anymore nor living in the south, if I think about China or about uh, Russia. And I think Senator Wong with, with us at the recent G20 will our colleague Lavrov in a four minute speech, or maybe three because we're not allowed so much time in G20, maybe used six or eight times this expression of the global. So it, it rang a bell then. Since then, I try to avoid to speak about the global south, but rather about building bridges. And building bridges was all about the summit France organized last June in Paris for a new global financial pact. In this regard, we very much welcome the APEC summit and the recent uh, Xi Jinping-Biden uh, meeting in San Francisco, which brought, how can I put it, some degree of highly needed stability to the world, or a way to uh, address and uh, be able to manage tensions. There is now a window of opportunity for more constructive dynamics, and I think that Europe and Australia have a role to play to help all stakeholders to make the best out of it. Building bridges is at the heart of our Indo-Pacific strategy. Our presence in the Pacific as well as the, in the Indian Ocean, by the way, makes us very specific in Europe. It gives us a deep-seated awareness that our fates are interwind. We are the first country in Europe to have published an Indo-Pacific strategy, announced here in Australia in 2018 by President Macron. We then contributed actively, I think, to the development of the EU Indo-Pacific strategy three years later, in 2021. In the same vein, we initiated during our EU presidency the first semester of 2022, the Ministerial Indo-Pacific Forum that is now instrumental for the engagement of the EU with the region. And while uh, we face in Europe the worst war since World War II with the aggression of Ukraine by Russia, far from retreating from the Pacific region, we remain more committed than ever to the Indo-Pacific prosperity and security. Since November last year, President Macron not only visited India, China, Japan, or Indonesia, but also countries where no French president had been for decades, if ever. Thailand, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Mongolia, Papua New Guinea, and Vanuatu. And we don't just talk the talk, we also walk the walk by increasing our footprints in all fields. First, the economy. Over 200 billion Australian dollars have been invested in the wider region by French companies and the Indo-Pacific already represents 35% of France's foreign trade. And when I say already, it's because we see it increasing, of course. We are in favor of uh, free trade agreements as long as they are balanced and take into account climate-related constraints and our social standards within the EU, two uh, new obligations under the new uh, EU regulations. And this is why we welcome the recent FTA with New Zealand. Very happy we could uh, finalize it. With Australia, we uh, have our own expectations, so do you, and they don't entirely match so far as we've seen so far, but it has led to a pause. I would rather call it a pause, and we remain fully committed to a fruitful conclusion of the ongoing negotiations. First, the economy, second, development. France is the fourth largest bilateral donor in the Indo-Pacific, and we keep increasing our commitment. Third, security. 7,000 French military personnel are stationed permanently in the Indo-Pacific region and regularly deploy first rank assets to bring especially humanitarian and disaster relief as quickly as possible. They also contribute to uh, 
the security of the region and ensure, as you know, freedom of navigation, including, but not only, in the Taiwan Strait. And of course, it brings me to China. I was there a few days ago, about 10 days ago, I guess. I'm a bit lost in my schedule, as everybody traveling too much. I just know we're Monday, but I'm not so sure. No, it's 10 or 12 days ago uh, in uh, Beijing for bilateral conversations, and I had very uh, fruitful and intense discussions with my counterpart, Wang Yi, and with the Prime Minister, Li Qiang. As you know, uh, the whole EU, and not France alone, defines China as both a partner, a competitor, and a systemic rival. And we think this triptych perfectly fits our very complex relationship. To us, the need to uh, try and work on a positive agenda with China is more important than ever. China has to hear at the highest level that we don't have any interest in hindering its economic rise, and it also has to hear our concerns and our expectations. There are many. The promotion by China of a potential alternative world order, human rights, where we have different views, economic imbalances and sometimes coercion, and a more and more uh, assertive, and I'm diplomatic by saying assertive, more and more assertive behavior in its neighborhood, sometimes threatening the safety of navigation. We are, of course, concerned in this regard with what happened a few days ago to the uh, Australian Navy, as well as what happened to the Philippines uh, a few uh, weeks ago. And then there is Taiwan. On this issue of concern to the whole world, we're sending very clear messages to all. One, France is fully committed to its uh, One China policy, 60 years old already, and there's absolutely no ambiguity without uh, doubt so about this One China policy. Second, there should be no unilateral change in the status quo by anybody. And third, calm and stability must prevail in this Taiwan Strait. And certainly the world doesn't need a new crisis. For all these reasons, we will keep engaging China constructively, and there are actually encouraging signs that our efforts are uh, paying off somehow in creating some positive trends of cooperation we sit on global issues such as climate change, biodiversity, or debt relief, for example, the last G20, for instance, but also on the economy to make it uh, more open uh, on the Chinese side, and certainly based on reciprocity and the rule of law and the respect of international rules between uh, all partners of the WTO. Uh, still some progress to go, as we know. In the meantime, we will accelerate our efforts to de-risk, and I want to be very specific here again. De-risking doesn't mean decoupling. It means building tools to preserve the strategic autonomy of the EU, such as the Union Anti-Economic Coercion Instrument adopted earlier this year, and China does the same. Our Indo-Pacific strategy is not and has never been a middle-of-the-road approach. Far from a polemics, it is actually very much in line with your corporate where we can, disagree where we must, and engage in the national interest. I hope I quoted it right, because I could subscribe to it. Let me, let me elaborate a bit on uh, what it means for us in the Pacific. France is a proud member of the Pacific family. Uh, in the Pacific, uh, we have a population, we have uh, territories, we have a huge economic uh, zone, we have interests. The 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent of the Pacific Islands Forum serves as well as for them, for us, as a golden compass. Our our compass, our compass, to contribute to the Pacific way for a resilient, free, and inclusive 
region. As an active PIF dialogue partner, I, I avoid to say PIF because PIF in France would, would, would sound referring to a, a comics, and it's not the case. So as an active PIF dialogue partner, in close cooperation with uh, New Caledonia and French Polynesia, two PIF members, France will be actively contributing to its implementation plan, including through the Pacific community where we sit together. To fulfill this vision of a shared future in the Pacific, we have built over the years a strong diplomatic presence of five embassies in the South Pacific and soon six with the opening of an embassy in Samoa next year. So it will be Australia, of course, New Zealand, Fiji, Vanuatu, PNG, and Samoa. We certainly are committed uh, with our Pacific partners to develop concrete solutions to the challenges faced by the region. And President Macron, last July, uh, spent several, several days visiting several Pacific islands. I just mentioned it earlier. And we can try to address together the challenges of climate, humanitarian, economic, maritime, or civil security. And these are not, these are not empty words. President Macron announced in July that France will triple its development aid to the Pacific, dedicating an additional 333 million Australian dollars over the next four years. And let me give you uh, just uh, a few examples. First and foremost, our resources will directly contribute to the number one priority of the 2050 strategy, fighting climate change and its dire consequences. In 2021, France launched the Kiwa Initiative. Australia joined it, so did New Zealand, Canada, and the EU. It has already raised over 127 million Australian dollars to help Pacific states adapt to climate change, increase resilience, and protect their biodiversity through natural-based solutions <coughs> defined and implemented with and by the communities. So quite uh, logically, by the way, when we heard about a Pacific partnership, uh, Pacific partnership for the Blue Pacific, I think it's the right uh, name of this initiative, to create synergies and avoid duplications, we wondered if this initiative might be taken on board. Uh, we're still wondering, so I'm just launching an appeal here so we can be uh, partnering more there. The same goes for uh, building climate resilient capabilities. France's direct responses here are around two uh, flagship projects aimed at detecting and mitigating extreme weather events as well as improving climate analysis. And again, they involve many partners. We have just launched, and I mean just, it's the day before yesterday, just launched with Papua New Guinea in Dubai, a country package, what they call country package, for forest preservation in cooperation with Australia and the EU, gathering $100 million to start with. And we've been working and renovating and greening ports in Pacific and Solar States, as in Rabaul in PNG, with Australia again and the EU. I would also like to underline the strong commitment of France to provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in the Pacific with its Australian and New Zealand partners through the France, France, Australia, New Zealand mix, France coordination mechanism that has proven so useful during its 30 years of existence. And the most recent example is in uh, Vanuatu in October with tropical cyclone Lola, but there were many before that and might be more to come. We're very much open to working more and more with uh, Pacific Island countries and not only for them in this regard. This is why we've uh, decided also to contribute to the Pacific Humanitarian Warehousing Program led by Australia with 1.7 million 
Australian dollar per year. Last July, President Macron reiterated uh, France's commitment to maritime security. French military assets in the region, again, 7,000 uh, people, have been upgraded. We will uh, bring an additional 200, and we are reinforcing the cooperation already undertaken with partners of the Pacific Quad, as well as beefing up uh, support to the Pacific states for the monitoring of their maritime domain. President Macron announced also in July the creation of a Pacific Academy based in Numea. It was just launched yesterday, which will help train civil and military personnel focusing on humanitarian and, uh, humanitarian and disaster relief, as well as on civil security. This academy aims to be a team player in the region, so open to the whole region. We're also working on students' mobility together with the South Pacific, New Caledonia, and French Polynesia universities. Last, the EU Crimario, Crimario program on maritime domain awareness would be extended to the South Pacific to fight against illegal fishing and marine pollution. And we hope to work in this framework with Australia and with bodies such as the Pacific Fusion Center and the PIF Fishery Agency to ensure that it brings added value. All these initiatives are discussed uh, right now in Numea in the framework of the South Pacific Defense Ministers meeting presided by, by my uh, colleague Sébastien Le Cornu, Minister of Defense for France, with the participation of your Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defense, Richard Mars. So we are having, just as I speak, uh, sort of a two plus two in uh, stereo, New Caledonia and Australia, just like we had uh, less than a year, a actual physical two plus two in Paris last January with Richard Mars and Penny Wong. We agreed by them in January that our relationship should follow two interconnected axes, the fight against climate change and the Pacific. And so we did. Over the past 18 months, that is the uh, time between the first uh, meeting between the uh, Prime Minister newly elected, Prime Minister Albanese, and its visit to Paris to President Macron, or 17 months if I judge by the first uh, meeting I had with uh, Senator Wong, we've worked hard and we've worked on an ambitious roadmap for the coming years around a set of very concrete projects, you see that, that are fully funded and ready to uh, deliver. And so Penny and I will adopt this roadmap later today. And I'm really pleased that we did work hard and could achieve this result. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, will uh, end here my, my introductory remarks, but be sure you'll find in me a true believer in the potential of our partnership. We're not starting from so low, but we have really increased the cooperation in the recent years, and we have a huge potential to cover. So I came to you to convey this message of our commitment to the region, and also to pass these measures of ambition for the future of French-Australian relationship. So in this difficult world, I repeat, we need partners, we need uh, like-minded countries to cooperate more, and we need more and more than ever to be bold, to be ambitious, and to stand shoulder to shoulder in this true spirit of Australian mateship. So thank you for that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, you, you're on a very tight timetable, so um, we'll go straight to the first question from Andrew Tillett. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Minister. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Australian Financial Review. Could you speak up a little bit louder? Sorry. Thank you. It's a bit, Sorry bit for, for me. Uh, I'll, I'll use your pen. Yes, yes, absolutely. 
Good. Yep. Andrew Good. Tillett from the Australian Financial Review newspaper. Mm -hmm. here. Okay. Um, you mentioned the roadmap that that you and Penny Wong will be uh, endorsing later today. Um, obviously, we had the big fracture with with the French government uh, a couple of years ago over the submarine contract. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yes, obviously. I was on the minister at that. But no, <laughs> that, no, that, was, yeah, should, that was the other mob's fault. Um, anyway, 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 can I ask you, <laughs> in terms of the, we, we obviously, before that time, there was a, lot, a level of intimacy between Australia and French relationship that had probably had been unsurpassed. What is the, the future going forward in terms of uh, where things are? There has been obviously repairs. We've, we've seen obviously your visit here and things like that. But where, where does it sort of go for the future, particularly around things like um, defence cooperation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I will not comment so much on, on that uh, episode. Um, we took note of a decision by a friend, Australia, to make uh, a sovereign decision. I wouldn't go as far as saying it was a very pleasant moment, but you know, we decided to uh, move on, so let's, let's move on. And this is what we did with the visit of Prime Minister Albanese to Paris on July the 1st, if I recall, um, at the Elysee. And with President Macron, we decided to uh, maybe uh, do a reset or at least write a new chapter in our relationship, not only in defense, but you will see when the roadmap will be published later today that we try to focus on uh, a series of priorities and I've named the Pacific and what we can do in the Pacific to be more present. You are our number one partner and you'll be, of course, a very important country for all these uh, smaller countries in the Pacific, but we would like to be more present here. We already have a footprint by our population, by our territories, but where we will invest uh, from now on. And with the EU coming, with the Global Gateways uh, you know, uh, initiative, we need to focus on the Pacific in the first hand and offer those nations um, a choice, the choice to uh, decide their own way and uh, to uh, have the potential to have several partners, to partner with when they want but not with uh, one dominant one, if I can uh, add this. And to focus, in addition to that first priority, on uh, climate change and the way we can fight together on climate change. We, we launched yesterday, along with Australia, that country package to preserve the uh, rainforest in uh, PNG. Uh, the roadmap will cover a, a wider uh, set of issues. It goes, of course, to the uh, classic uh, defense cooperation. So we, we have a very good operational cooperation. Uh, even without the roadmap, we do some maneuvers together and we face common threats, I believe. So we are partners in that. Uh, we will have also an economic and scientific um, pillar. And tomorrow while in uh, Melbourne, I will announce with one of the gentlemen here because the uh, French CEA will be partnering with uh, the uh, Technological Institute of Swinburne, is that it? Yeah. For um, uh, you know, program of uh, energy transition, both scientific and economic. We'll have some uh, private businesses on board as well. Uh, we need and can do more also for critical materials. Of course, we all know that it's uh, one important element of our liberté de la souveraineté uh, for all of us. And again, some uh, big players are also looking at these, but we want to decide by ourselves. Uh, space, the Antarctica, uh, exploration, scientific cooperation there is already on its way. And the third pillar will be on uh, what we call uh, human extensions, and that would cover uh, culture. We will launch a cultural foundation with an uh, opening of residences, and as promised 18 months ago, open not only to French or Australian um, uh, artists, creators, uh, uh, young talents, but also to young talents coming from the whole Pacific. So I think with these three pillars, uh, we will cover a lot of ground and try to 
use some of that potential that have been unused or misused. But that's not Thank a you. reference to your first comment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Stephen Jedgetts. Hi, Minister. Stephen Jedgetts from Hello. ABC News. Hello again. Hello. Um, I, I wondered if I could ask you about the agreement that Australia has struck with the island nation of Tuvalu, which I'm, I'm sure you would have seen. Australia has essentially committed to offer a residency pathway uh, to people from Tuvalu and in exchange uh, it's essentially extracted from Tuvalu uh, the right to exercise veto power over its security arrangements, and that's defined quite broadly. Uh, I just wondered, is this an arrangement that uh, the French government is favourable towards? Do you view it as a positive development? Uh, and do you believe it's plausible or desirable uh, that Australia potentially strike similar agreements with other smaller Pacific Island nations? And I ask, of course, particularly given France's current position as a resident power in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our territories are large and diverse, but not as big maybe as Australia is as a continent. Uh, no, we, we've seen that with uh, great interest. Uh, it is a way to address uh, some of these challenges we, we've been talking uh, about so, so far, including climate change, but I'd rather see uh, climate change being controlled and mastered. And that's what we did for a couple of days at COP28, just to mention that preemptive action maybe is uh, better than uh, taking some corrective measures when it is uh, late. I don't know the details. Uh, certainly it has to respect both nations' sovereignty. And I understand uh, it is uh, a subject of comments here, but I'm sure it does respect this basic principle of international law. Uh, should we be in capacity to uh, subscribe to similar arrangements? I'm not uh, sure. I'm open to consider any specific request, but again and again, the uh, size of the Australian continent makes a big difference with the size and beauties of French uh, Polynesia or New Caledonia. Um, hopefully just get to squeeze in two more questions very quickly. Sure, 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 okay, please. Okay, please, 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 of course. Thank you. Ben Packham. No, no. Uh, thank, thank you, you Minister. Uh, ben Hi. Packham from the Australian newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask you about Emmanuel Macron's uh, free advice for Australia on nuclear power in um, recent days. How does France suggest we make nuclear power economically viable given the scale of our renewable resources? And should Australian goods uh, sold into Europe be subject uh, to a carbon tariff if they're produced with coal-fired power? Um, I suppose, uh, thank you for your question, I suppose you refer to some comments made by President Macron uh, the day before yesterday Indeed. in his final press conference at COP28. Uh, where he referred to a call made by, uh, issued by many nations in favor of promoting nuclear civil energy in order to be one of the tools that can help us to achieve carbon neutrality, which is, as we know, absolutely and urgently needed if we want to avoid uh, bigger problems. Climate is changing. Climate is changing all over the world. It is still time to still time uh, to do something absolutely audacious to reach the plus 1.5 degree increase. Uh, time is short though and by all accounts, all studies from all bodies, we know that we need both to develop renewable energy and to have some nuclear civil capacities. So that was a call at the COP by uh, 20 countries or more to triple the production of civil nuclear energy by 2050, uh, based on scientific accounts that we will know both, you know, to triple renewables and to triple nuclear energy. It is uh, sustainable economically. Those countries, like my country, uh, who did the choice decades ago to invest into nuclear capacities, have uh, a relatively uh, low cost for energy produced by, electricity produced by nuclear capacities. So it's, it's 
you know, not a model, but it's an example, I would say, that we encourage other nations to follow, should they want to follow. This being said, one of the important uh, messages uh, by my president and um, uh, by everybody in the COP is that each country has the choice to make its own decision and to find the proper energy mix it desires. Uh, globally speaking, though, we would need both. We would need both, and that's for sure. Um, re regarding the uh, uh, tariffs, we need to make sure that what we would do in a specific territory, whether it is France or Europe, for example, uh, does serve this goal of carbon neutrality. And we cannot imagine that we can reach that objective with importing goods that have been produced elsewhere without respecting carbon neutrality or without respecting the rules that we apply to us, or it would just create an imbalance and would not, uh, there would be also, you know, an effect of uh, attracting uh, some disparities and uh, that's not what we want to see. So it'll come, that's already a decision taken, we have to implement it and fix the proper mechanism. As you know, it's a very complex issue. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, ben Westcott. Hello, Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Hello. Thank you very much for your speech. I think these gentlemen are so tall that you should have put the mic higher. <laughs> They're obliged to bend. No, no, it's, we're just not to respect. me, I know. Not to me. No, no, not, certainly not to me. <laughs> um, you mentioned in your speech that you're in favour of free trade agreements as long as they are balanced and pro-climate change. Does that mean France didn't necessarily think Australia's offer at the EU FTA agreements can aligned with those priorities? And did French concerns over Australia's environmental laws help derail that agreement? My, my understanding of those negotiations, and I uh, decide to uh, deliberately say that the door is still open for further conversations, and I'm not a technician and uh, certainly not the negotiator. You know, we negotiate is these agreements within the uh, EU and this is the competence of the EU Commission based on a mandate given by the uh, 27 states. But anyway, uh, we all have our interest. We have to combine these interests and find the proper balance so we increase trade. And I do favor free trade and we do welcome what we did with Canada, for example, what we did with Chile recently and what we did with New Zealand. My understanding is that uh, in the offer that the EU made to Australia, um, that offer was not considered uh, to meet Australian needs. So we thought it was a good offer, a generous offer, an ambitious offer. Uh, we might see how we can pursue the conversation if there's any will on your side as well to do so. So uh, it's not so much about defense this time, it's not so much about uh, climate change, but it was about agriculture as it took us some time to finalise with uh, New Zealand. But in the end, we did achieve this, so I don't see why we couldn't. Speak, Thank you. Speaking of uh, continuing the conversation, um, I know that you have uh, other conversations to go to today, yeah. but I would like to present you with this uh, membership card for the club, which has got Whoa. reciprocal rights Whoa. in Paris and Washington, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to come back and speak to us again at some other occasion. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So it's an invitation to come back to Australia because I'm just spending a couple of days here, one in Canberra, one in Melbourne, so I have to come back. Yes. Thank you. Yeah.